Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Smack, where we talk superheroes, movies, animation, and comics. I'm your host, Josh Scar, and this is a milestone episode. This is our 30th episode, and I am not overselling this when I say I think this is my most anticipated episode we have ever done. First off, I am joined by one of my oldest friends, one of my best friends, Matt. Welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks so much for taking the time. To kind of give you a rundown of what we're doing this week, Matt and I are going to be discussing Radiant Black, the comic that debuted last year, and they're about to hit their one year mark, and they're going to mark the occasion alongside the 30th anniversary of Image Comics with a big event called Supermassive, and we actually will have an interview later on in the show with the creators of Supermassive. So I am beyond excited. This interview will be something that I'm going to take with me no matter where I go. I'm going to like download it to an MP3 and just have it on the flash drive and be like, hey, I did this. Oop, I bumped my mic. I'm so yeah, excited about it's this. It's super rad. Yeah. It's not like this is like an exclusive or anything. I'm not trying to oversell what we're doing. It's just for me personally, this is really exciting because one of the creators, Kyle Higgins, is one of my favorite comic book writers right now. He's just a super cool dude. He grew up like 45 minutes away from where I grew up yeah. and he he's just a really super cool dude and I just I enjoy a lot of what he does and I can't wait to hear what he Ryan Parrott and Matt Groom have to say about this upcoming event so to start off with again we're talking the Radiant Black comic and uh, before we get into all that I do want to take a moment to just kind of discuss Kyle Higgins as a writer so Kyle Higgins got his start really with DC Comics with Detective Comics uh, he did a, a sh one shot called the Night Runner for an annual and then that built into another annual uh, with a Batman comic. And then he uh, had a, a co-writing spot with Batman Gates of Hell with Scott Snyder. Uh, one, one second. Sorry. Can I, can I pause yeah, you there? You can definitely so, cut in. Sure. Something will probably. Matt, Matt's literally fingering through the, the graphic novel it's, or the, uh, the trade paperback. Gates of Gotham, right? Not Gates of Hell. Gates of Gotham. Yeah. Sorry. Gates of Hell. It just. I don't know if that's a thing you want to like edit, edit or not. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. Those little things happen. But yeah, Gates of Gotham. Um, yeah, I flubbed that. <laughs> so his, his big break was really Batman Gates of Gotham. He did write a couple of annuals for Detective Comics and Batman. And then that spiraled into him getting his own comic with Nightwing, which uh, I know is one of his all-time favorite comic book characters, which is really cool. That's actually where I met him the first time. He was at uh, a C2E2 we went to, and I had found a copy of his Nightwing number one, which I, I hadn't known was out because I had just gotten back into comics around the time New 52 started. And I, I remember we were walking around the floor. I believe you were with me, Matt. And we were just walking around the floor and I saw Kyle Higgins and I just had this thought of, that name sounds familiar. So I pulled out this comic that I literally just bought minutes earlier <laughs> and the name was there and he's just sitting at a table all by himself. I think you even encouraged me to just go, hey, go ask for his autograph. It's fine. That's what these sort of things are here for. So I had a nice little chat with him and I got him to sign my comic. From that point on, I was a fan. I was just like, anything this guy does, I'm going to go research it and find it and get what I can. A lot of hay has been made about the New 52 and its quality or lack thereof. It's been a long time since I've read it, but that Nightwing book is one of the, one of the high points, I think. Even though I'll never really forgive DC for making Dick Grayson not Batman anymore, but... That's not his fault, I assume. <laughs> no, that's definitely not his fault. Uh, I'm sure he would have would have appreciated more writing Nightwing instead of Dick Grayson as Batman. But I think his Nightwing run is really solid. It yep. does get hijacked by a couple of Batman events throughout the run. Such is the way of those orbiting books. <laughs> exactly. Just like any X-Men book, you're going to be stuck in the middle of a really good story. And then all of a sudden there's a big like three month crossover. So the... The Batman book or, or the Nightwing book that Kyle wrote just it was really solid. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, he also did Batman Beyond 2.0, which was a continuation of the Batman Beyond animated series, which I enjoyed that a lot, too. I'm not sure if you read that or not. That one I don't think I have read. I've read some of the other Batman Beyond stuff, but the, the actual like cartoon continuation is not one that I have ever gotten around to. I should uh, I should uh, rectify that. Yeah, you should definitely do that. It's a it's a really good, good run, I think. I there are some things that uh, I think deviate from the animated series, but that's kind of what he does with these things, as we'll talk about with his Power Rangers run here in a minute, is he kind of takes it to 
what you what you kind of should do with a reboot or a continuation that that's been put into works after so many years of the the property not really being anywhere because you want to bring the character to where people remember them not necessarily what they actually were because if you did that with like the Batman the animated series and the Justice League animated series you're going to get a very different Batman from what we got between the two. Yes, they're both both voiced by Kevin Conroy, but there is a little bit of a character difference because the the Batman the animated series is kind of the good dad Batman where right. the Justice League Batman is more the loner that people really associate with the Batman character. So I know I said that Kyle Higgins kind of got his big break with Nightwing and Batman Gates of Gotham, but where he really made his mark was with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the Boom Studios reboot of the series, where it didn't necessarily discount or discredit the 1993 Mighty Morphin Power Rangers series, but it did exactly what we were just talking about with Batman Beyond, where it updated the the story and it brought it into the modern day, and it it kind of evolved the characters beyond just the the singular identifying tropes that they all were. Yeah, I think I've, I think we were talking about this earlier. I think we I, I have read his entire tenure on the book. I was somebody who was into the Power Rangers when I was a kid. And then I think like most of us, you know, we all kind of grow out of it. So I'm not, I'm not somebody who like would consider myself like a Power Rangers fan, but that run of comics really hooked me just the way that it like hones in on the characters and all the build up to it's the big crossover that sort of culminates that run with Shattered Grid where it's just like, Oh, we're basically doing Spider-Verse, but for the Power Rangers, where it's just, everybody's here. It's a big multiverse of Power Rangers, and all your favorites and all your not favorites are are here <laughs> are here for the party. That, that's actually a really great way to put it. it. It is a really, it is a Power Rangers version of Shattered, or not Shattered Grid, uh, Spider-Verse. Shattered Grid is the event that we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this would have been a couple of years after, I mean, who knows, you know, I'm not, who knows where the inspiration strikes, but. You know, I think it would have been a couple of years after the comics version of Spider-Verse. So I wouldn't, you know, who knows where that inspiration comes from. But it's just an interesting time in comics, those few years where it's just like, what if we just threw everyone in a blender and saw, and, and saw what happened? It, it was a really great blend of that nostalgia factor along with creating something new with a pre-existing property. And it, it just it hit the, at the right time because people from our generation that grew up on Power Rangers, that was... I remember almost vividly how the, I was anticipating that Saturday morning when Power Rangers debuted and I yep. immediately just ran downstairs to my parents and was like, they advertise toys. There's toys and I need them now. <laughs> I think I had every single one of those ones that um, they had these like monstrous gargantuan torsos because they had the heads that swapped. So like, I really did not like, <laughs> I hated those toys because of those torsos, I, I, I had all of the like 12 inch figures or the 10 inch figures, whatever those were. And then uh, my parent, I remember my dad and I, that was uh, in 1993 or 1994, that was a Saturday event for us was to run to Target, run to Toys R Us and see if they got the Megazord in. I never got any of those Zords. And that's something that I don't want to overstate it. I was going to say something like, oh, I'll, I'll never get over it, but. I'm an adult. I'm over it. But, you know, I wanted them is, is what I mean. The kid in you is still a little bitter. You yeah. know it. I, I remember so, so vividly. There was one day where I was walking around Toys R Us with my mom and my cousin and we found a Titanus and my cousin wanted it. And he's like, uh, Auntie Sue, Auntie Sue, you buy, the, you're you going to buy this for me, right? My mom will pay you back. <laughs> and I was like, no, I want this. You're here. We're here with my mom. We're buying this for <laughs> me. And my mom did end up buying it for me. And he, it was like the worst day of his young life. And it was like the best day of my <laughs> life. So Kyle Higgins, he wrote 35 issues of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And then he, he kind of went off and did a couple of other things. He wrote uh, Hadrian's Wall, which was kind of, um, uh, it was released in issues, but it was kind of meant to be a, a big space mystery novel for an image uh, that they did pretty quickly put out as an, an OGN. He was kind of quiet for a little while, and then he came out and debuted image uh, concept art and all this stuff for Radiant Black, which is what we're talking about today. It immediately just the look of it is just amazing. It It's a like all black helmet with little neon light up blue eyes. 
really simple black hole emblem on the on the chest with some white some black and it just it looks great and a lot of people who see this immediately go oh he did power rangers now he's making his own power ranger to a degree yes but one of my favorite things that they do with that social media team on radiant black is anytime someone says oh it's like power rangers if they see that they will uh, they will reply to it on twitter and they'll say what's a power ranger <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very striking image. It's not something that I was aware of, I think, before you really started hyping it. Um, and I think if it wasn't for you really wanting to read it, I would, probably wouldn't, wouldn't have gone out of my way to check it out. That costume is very striking, and you can you can definitely see, like if I was trying to give the, the elevator pitch, Power Rangers would be in there somewhere because you can see where the inspiration... You could see where, like... You know, again, I don't want to. I don't want to like talk to something I don't really know. I don't know where the ideas come from, but you could sort of see the seed there, where that's like there are some Power Rangers in that DNA. You know, yes. Um, even yeah, though it's, the, it's, the look is definitely it's, the it's, look it's, is definitely very Power Rangers. Yeah, it is more like it is. It is like that with a twist. It's not just like oh, where I'm making my own little team of four colored guys that hang out at the juice bar or whatever. But you can def <laughs> you can definitely see where maybe like you know writing you, you know right even if he even if it's not oh i love power rangers i'm gonna go to my own power rangers you know you don't write that many issues of the power rangers comic without having a love for that franchise that ip whatever the, you want to call Super it Sentai kind of thing which yeah he, he definitely does because he he went from writing power rangers to Co co-writing uh ultraman for marvel he had uh two separate ultraman runs where there was the the rise of ultraman that he wrote with matt groom who uh, we'll be interviewing later with this trio of people and he also wrote the ri the rise and the trials of ultraman yeah. those are the two books that he co-wrote with matt groom and he he obviously has his love he's i know he's talked about common writer as well so he he knows these super sentai characters and he has a love for that kind of brand and it really carries over into Radiant Black. There's yeah. not a lot of like giant kaiju fights or anything as of yet. We will put that <laughs> we'll in. And yeah, that that's. I feel like you can't really do a lot of what they're building up towards without getting to eventually some kind of kaiju. Yeah, you can definitely see where where the influence is. Maybe the best way to put it, where I said it before, it's in the DNA. Um, but you know, he's putting his own twist on that kind of story. It's easy to look at it just based on the visuals like oh it's power rangers but it's obviously power rangers but you know one thing i wanted to get to before we really get into radiant black is in the first issue of radiant black kyle higgins writes this love letter to the the, the people buying this comic where he talks about how in the third grade power rangers was the biggest thing ever and then by fourth grade it was just silly and dumb and no one cared but he still loved it and it got to a point where he had to pretend he didn't love it. And he would like secretly get the VCR to record each new episode. He would go play with his friends and he would like run inside to check and make sure it recorded. And eventually someone found out that that's what he was doing. And then he kind of became a pariah of his group of friends because kids are assholes and they'll do that sort of thing. And so he kind of had to, he had to suppress what he loved because of peer pressure and all these sort of things. And it kind of bled into his writing style and a lot of what he does. And uh, I'm just going to take a segment here from his uh, letter that he writes here. Uh, he says, I truly believe that outside of actual monsters, we're all just trying to do the best that we can. We're all just massive balls of insecurity. Personally, I think the world would be better place if just a bit more, if we had just a bit more kindness with a bit more empathy and a bit more honesty. And that's the type of superhero book I want to write. That's what Radiant Black is. I'm 35 at the time of issue one coming out. I have plenty of insecurities, flaws, doubts, failures, but I also think that those same insecurities, mistakes, and shitty experiences give me something to say, and that might resonate with you. And you can definitely see that, especially in like the first three issues of Radiant Black. So much of the first movement of this book is set up where like our main character gains these powers, this, these abilities, the suit, whatever, wherever the, you want to say the, the power comes from. And he's very much set up in opposition to other, another similar character that's coded as 
this is the bad guy, right? Over the course of the issues, you start to learn about that character and their motivations. And it's very much like they're not just a villain. They're doing these things for a reason. And then you meet other characters who have similar powers who also have like, there's the black one, there's the red one, there's the yellow one. So there's the power, the power interest thing again. But as you start to meet the team, sort of, so to speak, you know, they're all very different people, but they all have their own perspectives that are not just like, I'm the villain, I'm going to throw your girlfriend off a bridge or something, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of doing the wrong thing for the right reasons or the right thing for the wrong reasons in this book, because no one in this book is perfect. No one's an archetype. No one is a stereotype, really. Uh, one of the thing, one of the first two pages of this comic is our uh, protagonist, Nathan, who is having a phone call with a loan officer for a bank and he's trying to justify the fact that he needs a loan because he's in so much debt and he needs to be able to pay his bills and do all these things and they won't give him any kind of loan because of his debt to income ratio which is a great commentary on our current society i mean pre-pandemic society especially and now who knows what's going to happen post-pandemic there's a great moment where he's finishing the call and he starts hysterically crying And then someone kind of pokes in and it's revealed that he's like an Uber driver, essentially. (laughs) And the the guy who's getting in his car is just like, hey, uh, do you want me to call another ride? And he's just like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. As tears are rolling down his face. And that's even before we get to the title card of the book. So it's a great character introduction because we get a really good sense of where this guy is before he gets these powers. Yeah, and it's really interesting just because like, I can, I can, I can see, I've seen this kind of thing before, right? Where like, not this exact thing, but you can see the version. What am I trying to say? Put it this way. Uh, It's Spider-Man, but X is a very popular, I think, character type. You see that like Spider-Man, what if Spider-Man was Batman with Batman Beyond? Or like, just like the, the teen superhero who has these problems. I can see a universe where this these pages kick off this book that's basically like what if spider-man was superman well like he's like a down on his luck doesn't have any money but he's got like these amazing powers that make him able to fly and do all kinds of stuff that kind of stuff and that could be a really strong book but it like it totally goes off in different directions that i was not expecting when i first read this issue in like and and ways that i think makes makes the book better does that make sense where like you know i can see a a version where you're like you're trying you're trying to evoke peter parker in a scene where he like is desperately broke (laughs) before before he gets all his superpowers or whatever and you could just do that story lots of successful characters have done that kind of archetype but higgins here is doing something a little different and doesn't reveal itself until a few issues in which i think is really interesting i agree wholeheartedly that he you know he he kind of takes a little bit of a peter parker and he adds a little bit of like maybe a little bit of kyle higgins into it And then like, what if I became a Power Ranger myself? And one thing we didn't talk about really is that this is kind of set in the real world. It's set in Lockport, Illinois, which is Kyle Higgins' hometown. And it's he like actually went back home to do like photo shoots to make sure that they got locations properly done. Yeah, I, I admit when I first read this issue, I had not read that letter. Having gone back to it now and like, revisited it and seeing like oh i'm kyle higgins i'm a guy who lives in los angeles from like suburban illinois i'm like oh okay this is partially you (laughs) i see it yeah there's definitely a little bit of kyle higgins in nathan and there's probably a little bit of kyle higgins in marshall as well it's kind of like two sides of his personality and uh to kind of close out issue one we we get a little bit of a parallel to the way the issue started where he's like on the verge of tears and he's just talking about how nathan i'm talking about He's had opportunities to do good things before, and he's kind of blown it, speaking of his debt that he's accrued while going out to L.A. And now he's endowed with these powers, and it's he's just thinking, like, I can be a superhero. I can do literal good for people. Now I have to follow through on this for the first time ever. And then the hook of the first issue as well, besides, you know, this guy getting random black hole powers, is the issue ends with a red version of the radiant coming out of a bank with loads and loads of money, just looking jacked as all shit. Yeah. The obvious villain setup that they will later go on to subvert in really interesting ways. Yeah. And um, I'm going to have to edit this in towards the front, but spoilers for radiant black. These are all out 
by for a year now. And if you haven't picked up the issues or the trades, strongly recommend it. But we are going to be talking spoilers for this for about another 10, 15 minutes. So the Radiant Red that we run into, they are the the purported villain for the first five issues. Again, it's revealed later that it's actually a woman who is trying to help make up for her deadbeat boyfriend's debt that he's accrued through like gambling and mob ties, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it's like gambling and mob. And like, I think he signs away like their actual money. There's like a whole thing where he like steals it from her and stuff too. And so they're all basically in debt. And I, I believe before it's revealed that Radiant Red is a woman, they do a really great job of kind of subverting all that because you would have like the boob shield or something. You would have some kind of indicator that this person is a woman, but through their their powers, because each Radiant has a different skill set, they're able to kind of modify their body in a way and they, they absorb matter and they, they alter their suits so that people perceive them as a man. And they're able to kind of get away a little bit better with what they're doing and robbing banks and stealing money. Yeah, for most of these, I think for all these first few issues, it just looks like a big, a jacked dude. Like, the, you know, in, in, in superhero comics, it's the kind of person you see all the time. It's just a muscly guy. There's none of the telltale art cues that this is a woman. Yeah, I mean, you, you throw some spangly outfit on it. It's Captain America. You throw some red trunks and a blue onesie on them it's superman you you wouldn't know the difference but uh the the abilities of the suit allow them to alter their appearance to a degree and they actually are more powerful than the radiant black they're called radiance these little mini black holes that they have that give them their powers which are essentially also their morphers again if we're going to stick with the power rangers parallel which again the the quote-unquote morphing scenes or the transformation scenes that they draw up in these they're all fantastic. The artist is, I believe, Marco Costa or Marcelo Costa. I'm sorry. He's the lead artist on a lot of these early issues and the art fits the book so well. The book has a couple of like a twist on a twist where I believe by the end of issue five, Nathan has been knocked to the point of near death. And so the Radiant kind of leaves him and his best friend Marshall, who's there watching this fight between Radiant Black and Radiant Red he grabs the radiant and he becomes the new radiant black. And then that is issue five just ends with that. That's issue, uh, issue four, I believe just was uh, it four. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. And then we get a big fight in issue five and then we get a backstory on what actually happened with radiant red and who, who they are and their story and what their motivations have been. Um, but to, to really talk about Nathan really quick, one more time before we move on to Marshall, there's a really great spot in issue two after the, I think it's their second interaction or their second altercation where he's able to take the bag of money from radiant red. And he, he's sitting there looking at it. And he just sees hundreds of thousands of dollars in this duffel bag. He could get away scot-free with it. And there's no dialogue to these panels. You just see the money in his hand in the panel, his eyes light up. They kind of get a little darker and then they get really sad and you can just see in that moment. He's just like, I can't do that. That's not what a hero does. That's not what a good person does. Yeah. It's the Spider-Man moment, right? Or a Spider-Man moment. Pretty so much. You can't, you can't get rich doing this. Yeah. It's his Spider-Man's wrestling moment. Like you're saying, which I mean, to a degree, Marshall kind of subverts as well later on, once he becomes radiant black, where he teams up with the circle guy news network who kind of are keeping tabs on radiant black. Cause again, this is set in, kind of the real world, which again is something I'm going to ask the Kyle Higgins and the, the other guys about, because it's really interesting to me that you have this real world setting of Lockport, Illinois, and then you've get, you've got these four radiants that show up out of nowhere. Spoiler alert. Again, there's, there's more radiance, which we kind of <laughs> talked about. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we have these radiants and there is, there is eventually a villain that they, they dispatch pretty within like two or three issues. If I remember so I, I really want to know what the motivation is behind like, okay, so we have just regular world and now all of a sudden there's the radiance and now all of a sudden we have Infernal Girl Red and Rogue Sun. And I'm just like, what is happening with this escalation? <laughs> yeah, I think the Mar the Marshall stuff is like maybe, I'm going to put it this way and I think it's it sounds reductive. I don't mean it to be. I think it's probably the book's greatest trick so far, um, which is not to say that it's like just, uh, there's no substance to it. 
Um, Because, you know, for the first four issues, which is four months of real time, if you're reading this month to month, it is very clearly set up to be this this one thing, right? Where it's it's this kind of guy. This is his story. Here's like I was saying, it's it's got Spider Man vibes. It's got some power, like some kind of Power Rangers vibes. And then in issue four, it really just like yanks the rug out from under you and puts the character who is basically the stock. Again, I, that sounds reductive. I don't mean it to. I don't mean it to be, but you know, he's the sidekick. He's the the witty guy who is like in on the secret and helps him out and um, is moral support. Then he is then thrust into the position where he has the power and he is like not. He is very. He is a, a little less scrupulous, and he's now very angry because basically, for all his purposes, his best friend has been killed in front of him. He's he's not dead, but. Yeah, he he's near death. Yeah, so like that's 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 where the book I think not that it's it's bad before that obviously, but I think that's where it really gets interesting. Where it's like, oh, okay, you're playing you're playing a longer game than I than I thought you were here. Where now it becomes this other thing, and then even later, um, in more recent issues, it becomes another thing on top of that, which is also interesting. But it was a book that I was reading mostly because you wanted to, wanted to read it, and you were very excited about it, and that got me interested. But it's that, you know, and it was good and I was enjoying it, but it's that first fourth issue that I was like, oh, OK, this is now this is really interesting. I see what you're doing here. Yeah. Uh, Marshall is kind of the character that actually needs the development where Nathan, we kind of already have gotten the sense that he's a good person. He wants to do good. But now Marshall, who was kind of along for the ride and just enjoying it. Now he has to live up to that mantle that Nathan was setting or trying to set even. And that, kind of like what you're saying with the the Peter Parker archetype, what we could have seen with Nathan if he had continued on or if that was even the plan was they were even talking about because he's a writer. They were talking about how he could use the radiant experience to help influence his writing. Yep. And then all of a sudden he he's out of the picture and Marshall has to take over and Marshall's the one that now has to step up and be a hero, even though he's this kind of like still lives at home with his mom, stoner dropout who works at a video store, which there are a couple of early moments where it's very Randall from clerks where he's like talking to a guy about uh, what lies beneath as being a, a modern cult classic. And then the guy's like, I don't really like Harrison Ford. And then he just <laughs> is kind of like, get out of my store, <laughs> which I, I'm really curious if that was taken from like real world experience from Kyle Higgins or anyone on his writing team. Yeah, that, that's a thing that feels very, like, true to life. Like, that's a thing that happened to you. Like, you know, we, we both have had our stints in retail, and we think we have stories that, you know, burn into our memories, for better or worse. And I would not be – that feels like oh, yeah. one of those kinds of stories where, like, years later, you're you're retelling it or remembering it because it was just so weird or notable that you can't get out of your head. I've teased this before, but I at some point this year, I want to try and get a Kickstarter going where we, we hire some animators – and uh, we get a round table of like you, me, Lewis, Becky, Mandy, and we just share some of our stories and we get animators to kind of draw those out, uh, which uh, that would be a dream come true for me as well. But uh, so we'll leave some mystery as to like what else has happened in this book. But we, we've got you to the point where the radiant mantle is passed because of an assumed tragedy and the, the book is just fantastic. So uh, we do, when we do reviews, we do like what we like, what we didn't like. I don't want to, we've got a great interview coming up. I don't want to do any kind of dislikes. And sure. I think we've, we've talked a little somewhat critically about this to a degree. So uh, I mean, like what, what really stands out about this book for you? I, I, I think I alluded to it before is just the way that it is not ever quite what you think it's going to be right. Where like, I think the most notable example of this in my memory is that fourth issue where it kind of pulls the rug out from under you. And then the next issue is where Marshall is the one who really has his, like to keep the, to keep up the comparison, the Peter Parker moment where he's like, got the power and he's pissed and he's like, I'm going to kill this person. And then discovers radiant red secret that, or secret quote unquote, that she's a, a woman. And which then leads into a whole other thing about like, Oh, there's these other characters. And now we're going into like, what they're about even though the main one we've met is very was very villainous up, up until this point so it's just constantly like doing things that i'm i at least am not expecting and we're very willing to like not it doesn't spin its wheels is maybe the best way to put it it, it makes you think it's going to be one thing and then it's 
thinks you think it's gonna be another thing, and then it's like, I'm not that either. I'm gonna keep keep rolling, keep them guessing. Definitely. I mean, that's that's very well said and very well put. Probably better than I could have done. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy about this is that it's it's clearly got a plan. There's a lot of foreshadowing that's going on in some of these issues, especially with the fight. Once we get to the other radiance and the, the main big bad that happens throughout the first like eight or nine issues, there's a plan. And I think all of these little teases, it just keeps you asking questions and it keeps you coming back because it's intriguing. It's good. It's well-written and the characters are believable. The world is believable. Even with the idea that these are super Sentai characters, essentially that, eventually there's going to be giant robots and giant kaiju and it still just sounds amazing and he has a cape mode which i mean if you have a cape (laughs) mode you can't really go wrong with that right (laughs) Uh, are there any moments really i mean we've we've talked a lot about moments but is there any one moment that really sticks out to you in this it's tough just because i feel like i have covered a lot of them the ones that are really jumping out to me as as we've talked but like i think again that is that that one two punch of issue four and five in general are just like the main things I think of when I think of this book so far, at least what it is as of now. And also I think that, that first, that juxtaposition you were talking about before too, where like in that, in the, at the end of the first issue, where like Nathan's giving his big, like essentially, you know, power responsibility speech. Like this is, this is what I'm about. I, I can do something with this. And it cuts right to that, like striking image of red strolling out of the bank. And it's just like, those are two that, that I think stick with me. Um, And you know, those are, it's been a, it's been a bit since I've really been able to like run through and read what's out there so far. So maybe if I did a reread, I would come up with something else. But when I think of the book, when I'm not like sitting here talking about it, those are the things that that jump out to me. Totally, that that's those are really great moments and definitely things that are meant to stick with you. Uh, for me, with it being a little more fresh, I reread the first like two and a half issues trying to get ready for this, and I just ran out of time because family time just takes up so much so much of my day. I tried to read it like in bed, tried to read it during the day, but obviously work family, it just, it wasn't going to happen. I wasn't going to read 11 issues in about 36 hours in issue two. I believe Nathan's having a sit down with his dad and his dad's kind of talking about how you have to, you have to work. You have to do all these things. Writing's not paying the bills right now. And then at the end of the issue, he ends up making like $200 while also trying to do the radiant black thing and stop radiant red from robbing the bank, which he successfully does in this issue. And his dad kind of like pours out some raisins for him. He's like, that earns you some extra raisins in your oatmeal. (laughs) And the the conversation and the relationship that Nathan has with his dad kind of reminds me a little bit of, of me and my dad. My dad was always really supportive of what I enjoyed doing. Like if I were doing this podcast when I still lived at home, he would do everything in his power to try and make sure that I could do it. But he would also try to keep me grounded and be yeah. like, how is this going to pay the bills? How is this going to get you to the next level? How is this going to get you to anywhere? You need, you still need to make money. Cause my dad was always about, you have to have a good job. You have to pay your bills. You have to do all these things. Uh, but he was also very generous. Like Nathan's dad lets him live at home without having to pay any rent. The only requirement is he has to work. Yeah. So it, it really just reminded me a lot of my dad and that, that dialogue just really hit home for me. And that, that, that's a great moment too. And that's another thing where like, those first four issues are, are really just like building out this guy and the world around him only to like totally, you know, those characters are still around after the twist, but like, like I keep harping on, like we're really building out this world for this guy as our protagonist. And then they're like, well, maybe he's not the protagonist. <laughs> it's just such a, such a good trick too. Um, and not to, yeah, not to bring it back to my thing again, that is a very good moment. But as you're talking about it, I'm also thinking like, he spends so much time building up his dad and you see like, Oh, this is what the conflict is going to be where like he is, he's trying to do a superhero thing and write and make money. And his dad's like, you know, not mean, but it's kind of on his back. And then it's like, well, maybe, maybe his dad is not (laughs) as central to the superhero stuff as we thought. It's good stuff. It is really good stuff. This is, this is definitely as of right now, it is one of Kyle Higgins' magnum opuses. This is this is something that I know he really has intent to hold on to as a property. That's part of why he took it to Image, yeah. was because he wants to maintain that creative control. Uh, he actually already had a an offer for something. I can't remember if it was Radiant Black or if it was another one of his properties. I think it was Hadrian's Wall. He had a an opportunity, but again, because it's it's an independent comic, he retains the rights. 
and to the story and to the everything and that he was set to direct and he was set to write and then there was just too much studio interference and because he has creative control he was just like you know what we're done Good. and so if there ever is an adaptation of this he's going to be heavily involved and he's not going to let anything happen to the way this story is told and i think that's a great thing yeah that's awesome that's i mean that's one of the best things about image is that you know being able to retain that control over, over, over your work which is not true uh everywhere <laughs> yeah I've, I've done a scar wars before where uh i've talked about how it was before hawkeye started because david aha was talking about how he doesn't really care that he gets credit for it in the the rolling credits he wants money for his influence and for the the design as well he should Marvel's like, i mean that he, sh he should yeah definitely and marvel's just kind of like well we paid you to do this for us so you know you've been paid, you've gotten your money. We own this now. Yeah. I mean, I'm, which is true, but that's also the big problem, right? Where you take, when they were doing that book in 2012, I don't think anyone expected uh, that Marvel would, it would 10, about 10 years later, like basically ape the entire style for their big, very good uh, TV show. <laughs> and then not give them anything for it. That opening credit scene might have well, might as well have said designed by David. Otto. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We are aping his style. <laughs> So I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I'm going to be flying solo with the interview because that's going to be happening a little bit later in this week as uh, our schedules did not align. Unfortunately, I would have yeah. loved to have done this interview with you, Matt, but I'm going to take some of the, the points we talked about and try and bring that into the interview. But thank you again so much for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Talking Radiant Black with me. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk with Kyle Higgins, Matt Groom, and Ryan Parrott when we come back. But before we do that, we're going to continue this advertising project that we've been working with, with us, a handful of other podcasts. And you're going to be hearing a quick ad from the Breakup Gaming Society. And we'll be right back. If you like board game nights that feature a random cast of screw ups, along with lots of booze and expertly curated golden era hip hop, then Breakup Gaming Society is saving a seat for you, my friend. Give us a listen at BreakupGamingSociety.com or find us on Spotify. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We're going to get right back into it. And I'm very excited to share with you that I am now joined by the writers of the upcoming Image Comic event, Supermassive, and their editor, Michael Basudel. The writers being Radiant Black's Kyle Higgins, Inferno Girl Red's Matt Groom, and Rogue Sons' Ryan Parrott. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me and taking the time uh, to talk about this event. Thanks for having us. Likewise. Thanks so much for, for having yeah. us. Yeah the thanks goes all to you guys. I, I appreciate every second of this, honestly. Uh, you guys are all some of my favorite writers and I really just, I'm, I'm going to dive right into it. So I, I really want to know mostly, was Supermassive an idea that Kyle, did you have for Radiant Black and it just kind of grew as you and Matt and Ryan were talking or was it always a planned crossover event? No, it was, it was pretty much always, a, always the plan. When I say always the plan, I mean like we kind of had the idea and the way we operate is like when we like something, we then just do it. So it was pretty quick. There was a, a time we all, there was a Zoom call we had about a year ago. I can't remember if it was before Radiant Black had come out, uh, issue one or not. But I do remember like talking, we all, we're all talking about like, okay, we've done events before. Ryan and I have done Shattered Grid. Ryan has gone on and done a number of Power Rangers events since. Matt and I have done Ultraman and, and by the nature of the mini series plus backup stories that we were doing, it very much is, it's an event type approach to building out the mythology for Ultraman. And so we all kind of have these rhythms. And um, as we start talking about debuting a new series or series of series, because Ryan and I had been talking about Rogue Sun for as long as we'd been talking about Radiant Black. And so the idea was always like, we have to find a way to do a crossover, but it has to make sense. It has to be the right time and, and it has to be story driven. And so we kind of all jumped on a Zoom, just talking about what the shape of things to come could look like with Rogue, with Radiant Black, you know, coming out. And, and we had a sense at that point it was going to do, it was going to do pretty well. Um, and then the plans for Inferno Girl Red and the plans for Rogue Sun and how could we best maximize that? And then it was actually Michael that realized, well, February of 2022 is the exact 30th anniversary of Image Comics. And it's also the end of year one of Radiant Black. 
And so there were different permutations of then what we do rogue sun rate, um, infernal girl red wise, like timeline wise, but it quickly kind of coalesced into what's become super massive. I think the hardest thing was coming up with a title. It takes a while. Yeah. I like the title because it blends into the black hole idea with radiant black. So I really, I really enjoyed that. Yep. So uh, this oh, was a, that was a Michael oh. special. I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. that was great. I didn't think I'd get any exclusives. And here we go. I've, I've got a realization. Well, tell me more, guys. What else is going on in this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan, you know, Ryan, you know how your book is called Rogue Sun? Hey! He's also the son of the guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah all right. Right. Yeah. If I got that, if I got that Rogue Sun interview, I was, that was going to be one of my leading questions. There you go. There, there's a play on words here. Do you want to tell us about yeah. it? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to save I'm, that one. Yeah. Apparently, I'm just learning about it, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so Amazing. this next this next question is for uh, Matt and Ryan. So we we know Radiant Black. We've gotten to know Nathan. We've gotten to know Marshall. Why are we skipping an origin story for Rogue Sun and Infernal Girl Red to go into Supermassive? Well, I, well right, you can give us. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, are you skipping an origin story? That's the interesting part. Um, I think it was one of the things we liked about uh, about having where this took place in the timeline. It was because uh, I had like a, the initial pitch that I gave to, to Kyle was about a kid who's sort of a you know rebellious teenager who discovers after his father passes away that that uh, he's inherited his par- his father's superheroes or super- superpowers and mantle. And it's about in order to sort of become a hero, he has to sort of learn about the guy that left him when he was a little kid and he's hated the most in the world. And, and sort of like, how do you, how do you live in the, how do you fall in the footsteps of somebody that you hate and how does that change you and all that stuff? So that was stuff we had originally pitched. But then when we talked about, as we were talking about in the early stages, when we realized it was super massive, I was like, well, we don't actually, we only get to see the father for a little bit in the in the in the first issue so super massive gives an opportunity to actually meet their for the original or one of the original rogue sons before you do it so in, in essence it all works linear it's actually the best way to read this if you read super massive it gives you an insight into who he who who marcus bell actually is and what that character is going to be like and so that when you step into rogue son number one you'll meet dylan and you'll actually have it a concept of the person that he's actually talking about so origin story wise it actually works just fine and a little different situation for inferno go red because uh, Infergo Red Book One, which is coming out later this year, is an origin story for Cassia for Infergo Red. And obviously, Supermassive is coming out first. And that was, you know, a bit of a thorny thing to tackle, I think. But it, it really clicked into place for me when I realized that what we're doing with Supermassive is, as much as it is a whole satisfying, self contained story in and of itself, it's also a statement from us about what we're doing and the future of this universe and what we're trying to achieve. And it occurred to me that this is something, an opportunity to sort of do that for Cassia as well, to give people a vision of who she's going to become, the sort of hero that she will be and where she's headed on her own trajectory. So you don't need to have read Inferno Go Red, obviously, because you can't have to read and enjoy Supermassive, but it will be informative i think of if you read this and you're like oh wow i really want to know more about this person then you're going to have the perfect opportunity in reading in front of go red and i think the the way we've all tied it all together and made sure that you can read this completely fresh having not read anything uh but if you've read radiant black you're really going to uh appreciate and get more out of it uh and if you read super massive you're going to have a better insight into these characters and what makes them tick in this world. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's a great jumping on point for anybody, but also it's going to greatly enrich and expand your experience uh, if you're really invested in this universe. I do love the idea that we're meeting Cassia after the origin story, because again, it gives us an idea of where she's coming from. And we get a little bit of that backstory with the Kickstarter that uh, I, I backed. I want you to know that I'm very oh, excited for that. I appreciate that. I was <laughs> so close to doing one of the helmet tiers. I was, I, I kept looking over at my wife and saying like, can I do it, please? Can oh, I please? Man, they're so expensive. So I, I totally get it. We, when we, and we had a baby on the way. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You had to make some hard choices. So that's totally fair enough. Again, I don't baby. know that you made the right choice, <laughs> but you know, it, in an alternate it. in an alternate reality, you're walking around in a Cassia helmet and a radiant black it's hoodie such somewhere. Such a nice but with helmet. Two children with, that, with the sweatshirt, it would look so good. Like you'd be your one child's uh, 
favorite parent. Uh, yeah. it's there's like an alternate there's no that I am try to sell on, him on it. There's an alternate the, reality I, where I have a blue Power Ranger helmet, a radiant black helmet, and an Infernal Girl red helmet, and I would just be the happiest nerd in the world. Doesn't have to be an alternate. <laughs> I just need to get a better job. That's it. <laughs> so what can you guys tell us without spoiling anything or giving anything away that you can't uh, about the end story circumstances that bring these characters together? Yeah. Uh, well, Cassia in Red is searching for something. She's after something very important to her and on, on a journey to get to it. And on that journey, somewhat inadvertently, she ends up in the universe of Radiant Black and Rogue Sun. And because of that, that sets off a chain of problematic events that brings the three heroes together because of their respective uh, sort of areas of interest. Uh, and if that sounds vague, that's because we're trying to keep things relatively fresh and surprising for you. The consequences of it are... Uh, super massive uh, for all three characters. The implications are huge. So we want to try and, yeah, keep those vague fossils so you can enjoy it when you're in the moment. Sounds like, so this is going to be a, a multiversal kind of scenario where not everyone is in the Radiant Black universe. Yeah. I think we could say that yeah. Inferno Girl Red is not from around here. She will be coming in from elsewhere. Yeah. I, I will say it's been very gratifying. Like we went and saw the new Spider-Man movie and I won't spoil anything, but it's nice to learn like audiences just they'll just take it at this point. Like th there is truly no explanation needed. You can just be like, they're from another universe and everyone yep. goes, yeah, got it. Yep. We, we're, we're on board. We get it. Yep. I appreciate the no spoilers. I'm one of the like three people that haven't seen no way home yet. Oh, you, you gotta, it's real good. It's real it good. is really good. It's really yeah. good. I've got a baby and my, yeah, uh, that's someone that's immunocompromised to so go into a theater in an area. Uh, that's yeah, not of course. Fully it's a, a lot of a good reasons difficult. to not go to uh, cinema right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, in, and in another reality, there's a guy sitting with a Cassia helmet and a radio <laughs> black hoodie watching <laughs> Super Spider-Man. No, no, no. no way home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I would rather be in this universe right now because I'm, I really, again, truly appreciate and loving my time with you guys. Very good. Oh, um, thanks. What made you guys think that this would be a good idea for a one shot instead of making it a mini series? That's a really good question. I think. Oh, can I can I take this card? Yeah, please, please. A mini series would have driven us insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like that. That's a joke, but you know, <laughs> it's it's also we like everybody is working on their own individual books as well as other books that are outside the scope of this. And but so also, this is, it's so hard I'm, to make it's hard to make every issue of a mini series feel yeah. special. And first and foremost, we wanted this to feel special. Yeah. So there are some things that we're doing in it that we are not we're not going to spoil that are in the spirit and in the um, they're in the in that spirit of we're doing it to make it a special experience. Um, and so focusing it at, at all as one single story and one, you know, one book you can pick up um, that we're not even planning to collect at this point felt like a really um, fun opportunity to kind of really focus all of our attention and energies into making the one special yeah. version of, of this story. Yeah. And, and speaking as somebody who has, who writes, when I write Power Rangers, my arcs just keep getting longer and longer and longer and longer. <laughs> Having just a best story, I, I've discovered, that, you know, when you get reactions from fans, it's like, you know, like they'll read the issue and like, that's great. I wish that I wish the one, next one was out right now. And there's something cool about being able to just give them the whole story in one spot and go, yep, you can, you can enjoy it beginning, middle and end and boom. And and I feel like that's super, especially in today's sort of, you know, very, very sort of muddled, uh, you know, comic book universes. We're just like, there's just so much. It's like you only have this much time to get anybody and grab onto it. So it's like, here you go. You can read this and then you can you can move on with your life, which is good. You know, as opposed to like got to wait 30 more days for that cliffhanger and then you wait 30 more days after the next cliffhanger and stuff. So I like that part of it. I, I think, too, one of the inspirations that we talked about is in Super Sentai, which is what Power Rangers is, ad is adapted from every year they have a new team and a new story but between each one to sort of like hand over from one season and one team to the next they do a team-up movie uh, which is totally self-contained it sort of is a nice bookend on what happened 
in the previous year and it teases and sets up what's in the year to come. And it feels like just such a precise, exciting, in the moment, one-off event. And I think that's kind of what we're chasing, that feeling of like just this one like fantastic, exciting moment in time that sets the stage for the future, not something that drags on for half the year. I've got a couple of questions left for you. For anyone who's coming into this event with no prior knowledge of Radiant Black, the Kickstarters or anything like that, what's one thing about each of your characters that you would want someone to know going into the book? I think when Erica and I were creating Cassia in Infernoco Red, we wanted to try and create something that felt authentically like a teenage superhero that is relevant to the times that we're in now. And I think coming of age now is radically different to any other time in history. Uh, It is in a lot of ways, there's a, a lot of potential in the world, but it's also incredibly dark and omnipresent and having hope can be really difficult. Uh, And trying to figure out what does it mean to come of age in a time when having hope is so hard and what does it mean to try and be a a bit of a light in the dark. But also I think part of working with Erica was like, how do we create something that feels so authentically like a young person? You know, I think for for a few decades now, we've seen a lot of uh, teenage superheroes that have been created by very old men and feel that way. Um, whereas this is not the case. I think one of the reasons we let Erica in is her, like she is young and she is incredibly connected to youth culture and she has this fantastic energy. So my hope is that we're creating something in Infernal Go Red that genuinely reflects teenagers now and reflects what they're going through and reflects their culture and experiences. Uh, well, I'm a very old man. And so I, <laughs> I grew up, I, I grew up, uh, I'm the reason I got into comic books is because I was 13 when image started and I bought every single book of those first issues. I remember I'm like there yesterday, I, I got up. It's the first time I ever had a box at a comic book store where they would just put the stuff aside for me. And I just like all my money went away for it. So my dream, I went into, I went into art. I went to art school um, because I wanted to draw on image comics. So the idea that literally 20 years later that I would actually get to make an image comic book superhero and let them be part of that universe and be part of that world is the greatest gift. And it's like the thing I could never imagine. And so for me, when I, so when you meet rogue son, like he's my version of, of an image superhero, maybe even somewhat from the nine, from the nineties. Like I like that aesthetic. I'm excited for that. So it's a little bit of a throwback well, character. I think Ryan, you can talk about how long he's been around. Yeah. Yeah. The characters, the idea is Marcus is sort of the old man of the group or oldish man of the group in the sense that there's been multiple rogue sons all the way back through history. We'll find out in the, if this, in the series, how many there have been, but he's been around for 20 years doing this. So the idea is he might've been around in the nineties if we want to play with that. So, uh, and as opposed to the, uh, as opposed to radiant black in in front of gorilla, which are sort of relatively new, that was one of the things we liked about the writing of it was that my character gets to come in and I don't like to use comps, but like gets to be the bit of the Tony Stark to the Tom Holland of it all gets to come in and be like, yeah, he gets to be the grumpy old man, which I'm really good at writing as being a grumpy <laughs> old man. So uh, but that was the fun part of it. So like it, that was it. That was the voice. And so, yeah. So if anybody who's reading it, like if you like those and that if you were raised like I was in that, like my character is a little bit of a throwback yeah. to that sort of age. Well, and that's that's kind of the, the fun thing also like to point out, like not to put too fine of a point on it, because I do think we take more of a Sentai season to season approach as far as universe uh overlap goes but you know we call this the massive verse but really that's our corner of what is essentially the image superhero universe so there's a savage dragon reference in issue one of radiant black um rogue sun has been around a minute so you know you saw in issue nine of radiant black uh there's a wizard magazine cover with cowl well, why are, what is Cowl if it, as an image series that was also a movie franchise in this universe? Well, why was it a movie franchise? Is it based on reality in this series as well? So there's a lot, there's a much larger tapestry and that tapestry is there when I think all of us would probably say, or maybe you guys would disagree, like I'm a big fan of like, I'm not a big continuity fan, like con- continuity at, at, for me at this point as a fan and as a reader is like when it's convenient, cool. But if it's like, I don't like stories that are about answering continuity, you know? Yeah. So we, I like that we're all building kind of our own thing, but like there are these other 
threads that we could intertwine to the extent that we may want to going forward or not. Um, so there's a lot of kind of uh, flexibility for us. Much like Ryan, I just learned something new. I've been trying to figure out what that thread is with Cowl. So knowing that it's something that existed in this universe, not just as like a movie is something really cool for me to just learn now. So thank you. Um, well, I don't know that I've actually confirmed that, oh, but <laughs> fair enough, but at least there's some kind of more there's, I've learned something a little bit more about how Kyle exists in the universe. I will. I feel like, uh, I'm probably just phrasing it poorly. No, 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 no. You're right. No, I was going to say like, like that's, that. um, that is an accurate, that, that is an accurate statement. So, <laughs> all right. So the last question I have for you guys, if I have the time in, Invincible, they talk about how you, everyone wants that iconic look. Mm -hmm. And I think all three of you have nailed an iconic look for your heroes. They all look fantastic. They all look instantly recognizable. How was the process of finding those looks and how was that concept? Did you have it in your head immediately or was there an evolution of those looks? Well, for Radiant Black, I knew the parameters that, you know, Marcelo and I were talking within were um, very much rooted on or rooted in helmeted hero, more like Sentai aesthetic um, as our starting point. Um, and so that actually made it fun to um, figure out new ways or, or even just um, updated, you know, lines to bring to that kind of aesthetic. Um, and so we ultimately landed very, very early on what became the final design. Um, and for me, like the second that we had that, I felt a hundred times better about the prospects of building a new superhero. It was pretty, it was pretty quick, but it was also like, you know, I like having in those cases, especially with superheroes, like having a defined parameter made it a little easier for us. Yeah. And I, I got really lucky, like Abel, the artist on Rogue, Rogue Sun, he came in and we were just really, like, we had like one conversation. And I think I said, you know, I'd love it if he was like, I gave him some comps in regards to like the tone, but I was like, I'd love if it was like a knight that was on fire. And that's literally what he drew one time and we were done. And I was like, yep, you got it. I was like, can we turn the fire up a little bit? He's like, yep. And then the fire sort of poured out of the seams. I was like, you nailed it. So I, I'd like to take credit for it, but it's all him. Abel brought the entire visual aesthetic to it and I couldn't be happier. It wasn't so clean for Inferno Go Red. Erica Durso, the co-creator and artist on Inferno Go Red, and I went through, I think, literally dozens of variations and alterations on it. And th there was, like, so much cool stuff throughout all of them. But we were trying to hit something very specific, which we had a bit of, like, we wanted that Tokusatsu inspiration threaded through there a little bit. But we also wanted it to feel young and youthful and i think honestly a lot of the reef to ourselves is what should superheroes of the future look like like let's try and get away from convention and think forward a little bit and be as progressive as we can be and i think erica is like she's got such an incredible keen eye for fashion and for youth culture so she was able to bring all of that and it was just about picking the right pieces. And I think the reason there was dozens of versions is because she had so many different ideas and we just cycled through and combined elements and uh, yeah, endless seemingly cycles of refinement until we got to one that once all those pieces clicked together, we just went, oh, yes, like absolutely that's it. And I'm so glad we went through the, the circle, went through the process because I'm very happy with where we ended up. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me. Uh, we've got Kyle Higgins, Ryan Parrott, Matt Gr Groom, and Michael Basudo joining us. And again, this was the time of my life. This is the coolest thing that we've done. And this is actually going to be our 30th episode. So I find it really cool that oh, it's also going to kind of coincide oh, with Image's 30th yeah. anniversary. So yeah. I, I was like, oh, it's a little bit of kismet. But hey, I, man, again, you guys, you guys have a super massive year as well. <laughs> stay radiant. Super yeah, massive. Oh, yeah. There we, I like that. Super massive hit shelves on February 16th. Go to your local comic shop, bookstore, your preferred online retailer. Give it a pre-order. Buy as many of those variants as you can. I've seen some of those artist exclusive ones coming out and they look fantastic. You guys mm -hmm. nail the, the variants on everything. I My wallet weeps. That's part of the reason why I can't afford these helmets. <laughs> it's part, part of the reason why I can't get these hoodies. It's because I'm too busy <laughs> buying all these comic variants as well. But thank you again so much. And you guys take care. And everyone listening, thank you again. Take care. Thanks, Take care. Yeah. Bye.